Isn't this beautiful? This is where I got married many years ago, where my married life began and all my hopes and dreams for what marriage was going to bring me, which would include children, a happy family life, and eventually growing old with my husband. He was the man of my dreams. It was the hottest day of the year. Everybody was drenched. It was an intimate wedding. There were 45 people, closest friends and family. And I just remember the day I got married, I was just so nervous. I had this nervous energy where I, I couldn't sit still. And I remember going for lunch with my maid of honor. I'd sit and I'd eat a little bit and then I'd get up and I'd pace and I just couldn't sit still. And then we arrived here, I got out of the car and my garter fell off my leg. And my son, who was eight at the time, picked it up off the, the ground and handed it to me. And at that moment, somebody grabbed a pitcher. From that point on, all the nerves just fell by the wayside. And we all just started laughing. I was completely relaxed, ready to move forward with the marriage and marry the man of my dreams. My son gave me away. And when I walked down the aisle, I could just feel the love oozing from everybody. And uh, we got married on the hottest day of that year. So now here I am, many years later, a separated woman producing a documentary on separation. Who would have ever thought? For me at the time, he was an excellent husband. And looking back as well, I'm extremely grateful for the, for the happiness I had and the love. Because if you haven't lived it, I don't think you realize the impact of that sudden loss. In one sense, um, it's like a death because, you know, things have severed so, so quickly, yeah. I had a great life on the outside. We had, you know, the big house, all the cars, the cottage. And even him, like people would look at me like, what, what else do you want? What else do you want? Well, I wanted the stuff that our money or his money or anything couldn't buy. Like just the connection and the friendship, the respect. I really tried my best to be an excellent wife. You know, I was a very appreciative every day. Uh, I loved my husband. I tried to support him. And I just couldn't be who he wanted me to be in the end. I just couldn't go, you know, to that place because I knew if I went to that place, then that would be, that would be taking my soul away. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to sacrifice because I, I didn't want to sacrifice my happiness and what was important to me for, for the marriage. My life was beautiful. Big, beautiful house, beautiful backyard full of gardens that I constantly was working in. Lots of friends around all the time lots of family, 
lots of kids running around because all the kids wanted to be at our house with my kids. We traveled a lot, um, and we always took the kids because we loved their company. Um, it was a great life. I was not gonna be the girl to get separated. We had a solid marriage, we were the perfect couple. And when I walked down the aisle, I thought, I'm marrying the right guy. My life as a military wife was one that I truly enjoyed. Some people would find it very stressful, moving every two to three years, but we looked at on it as a new adventure. So I really enjoyed the military lifestyle. As a military wife, I think probably the main thing I gave up was focusing on my career. Uh, but in regards to everything else, really my, my childhood dream was to be happily married with a family. So as a military wife, I still had that. So I didn't see it as giving up really much of anything. He was born in Europe and lived there till he was about 15 years old and was nine years older than me. I didn't, I didn't perceive any major um, cultural differences um, at the time that we got married. My parents were a lot more concerned about the age difference. Um, that didn't concern me either. But once we had children, all of these personal differences, what I perceived at the time to be cultural differences, just started to manifest. Um, and all the difficulties of having a newborn baby, his ability to deal with the sleeplessness. Uh, his mother had also passed away when I was um, pregnant with my daughter. I think he had some depression there that he hadn't dealt with. So there were a lot of factors um, that went into my really feeling that there were cracks in the marriage by the time I was in the middle of my pregnancy with our first child. In that last year, we identified probably three or four times that this was it, like this was it. Were there red flags? For sure there were red flags, lots of red flags. Part of me thought I could fix them, change them. Part of me was naive to them. And part of me overlooked them. But for sure there were lots of red flags before we got married. In hindsight, there's always red flags. At the time, we just, you know, you seem like you're bulletproof, that you, you can fix it, or you can move through it, or, but ultimately, um, there were a few things absolutely that maybe should have, should have stopped us in our tracks, or, or put a little bit of focus on to, to work out a few things, yeah. I mean, say, I think with 2020 hindsight and looking back, you can always find signs, but when you're in the situation, you're happy and you feel that things are great, then there were no red flags. I was making excuses for my spouse a lot. So if I showed up at a family party, and he didn't come or he showed up in his own car two hours late and left a few hours early, I would often get you know, sideways glances from my parents or my sister or my brother-in-law and I would always offer excuses for him. You know, there's a tipping point where you start to say, wait a minute, how much of my time am I spending making excuses for my spouse? And at what point um, is it not okay for me? You know, is this not a good marriage for me? And especially with having children, I think we all have a lot of conversations within ourselves where we say, you know, is it really that bad? Can we keep the marriage together? I stayed a solid seven years longer than the first moment that my gut told me that this was not a good person for me to be with. One evening, getting very close to the time that I moved out, we were in his car and we were driving to a party. I don't really remember what it was for. Um, I didn't feel like going. I didn't feel like pretending that my husband and I were still happy. And we got into a fight in the car where he threatened to take full custody of the kids. I became hysterical in the car. I've never had a fit of screaming or crying ever in my life. Uh, to match what happened in that car. That beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon, when I sensed my husband's quietness, I approached him lovingly and said, please tell me, you seem stressed, what's the problem? 
And then he said, just leave me, it'll pass. So that then tweaked my interest and I said, what will pass? And he said, no, just leave it. So I pulled out a chair, sat down at the table beside him and said, I am your wife, so please tell me. And as I waited, how was I to know that in the next few moments, my world would come crashing down as I heard him say, I can only be 100% happy if I'm with a man. After he, he uttered those words, I think I, my whole world just shattered. I totally thought, my first thoughts were, what does this mean? What can this mean? And after that, it just, my world was spinning out of control. I think was our, our big last blow up where ugly words were said and, and words hurt and words can't, you can't take words back. And I, my, at the time, my, all my worries were focused around the kids, like what they were, what they were witnessing, what they were seeing, the energy that they were feeling. And my eldest was in her final, going into her final year of high school. And the, I know the younger kids were asleep, but I went into her room after kind of the blow up and, and She heard everything and she just kind of looked at me and said why and in that moment I knew that um, I couldn't continue the way we were we couldn't continue the way we were and send her off to university into the world as a woman and say that this kind of stuff this this is what <laughs> this is what a relationship looks like this is what a marriage looks like this is what normal is because it wasn't it wasn't so that was that was the day I moved to a different bedroom I found out on Christmas Day that he had been having an affair he left his email open and there was an email that said to her I'm love struck by you Merry Christmas babe I went downstairs I called him up this is five minutes before my family was coming over and I was putting on this big Christmas dinner. And I sat in the foyer just ready for my parents. And I said, I saw the note. And he, he fell to the floor and he went, oh. He says, I really have a problem. I said, yeah, you do. Have I shared my darkest day? Possibly, I think, with my mom after some time had gone by. My dad too, but it was really um, more heartfelt telling my mom because she suffered too through the separation. She looked so up to my ex that it affected her health-wise as well. I was working on my marriage because I wanted my children to grow up in in a household with two parents and create traditions for them and not ha want them to have to go back and forth to two households. So I tried to be the glue to keep the family together. I basically stayed in the marriage for 10 years longer than I should have. I did try to keep my marriage intact um, from about the second year that we were married, and this was still several years before we had children, I had started to see some discord, not a huge amount of discord, nothing that was a huge moral issue, but really the, the details of everyday life um, kind of issues. And I asked him if he would um, be willing to see a marriage counselor. He wasn't. Once we had kids and some of the problems got bigger, we did end up seeing a marriage counselor, which we saw for, I would say, at least five years. And it was a private counselor, so it was quite an expensive process. Um, so yeah, we, I feel like I made every attempt to keep the marriage together and, and solve the, the disconnect that was happening. I think he felt we needed to go for therapy. I was angry because 
I didn't, I, I just was not very receptive because I was still thinking this should not be happening. If we were so happy, why are you basically messing this all up? Before we got separated, yes, we went to therapy. It was a weekend, I would like to call it a boot camp. It's an organization called Retrovive. And everything had gone really well. We were solid for two months. And I thought I would save my marriage. I became a Stepford wife is the best way to say it. I just turned myself around and I became something that I'm not. Um, I was the perfect mom, but I always felt I was. But I became the perfect wife. Years before we actually separated, you know, we'd had several bouts of counseling. I initiated, you know, when, when things would come to a head and built up explosion, we would go to counseling for several sessions. Some of it effective, some of it less than effective. Some of it, unfortunately, would just open things up raw and then they stayed that way. You know, we didn't finish the process of, of the healing and moving through it. Throughout it, I was willing to do anything. It just came to, it just got to the final straw. We hadn't been getting along for about six months. And one night he told my daughter that um, he was leaving us and going to live with his aunt. And she came downstairs in tears saying, dad is going to leave us. And I couldn't believe that he was telling this to his daughter and not discussing it with me. And I went upstairs and I said, you told our daughter you were leaving us. Is that true? And he said, yes. And I said, well, if you're leaving, get out now. And um, he wouldn't leave. And a few hours later, I was still at him to leave. And I was getting quite angry at him. Um, and unfortunately, I started throwing some things at him and told him to get out, and he left. It was Sunday, December 4th. We had just celebrated my son's birthday the day before. And I was in the kitchen, and he seemed to be really on edge. And I said, is, is everything OK? He said, no, it's not. And I said, well, what's wrong? And he says, I'm not happy. I looked at the time because I thought, this is going to be something that I'll never forget. And I asked him to go to the family room, and we sat down. And I said, are you in love with me? He goes, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. And I thought, oh my god, here we are. This is not supposed to happen in my life. And I said, well, what is it that you want? And he said, I want to come home to a wife and a normal child. I want a normal child. My son has been diagnosed with dyspraxia. It's what they call it in other countries. In Canada, they call it DCD, uh, Developmental Coordination Disorder. So it affects gross motor, affects fine motor, and oral motor. He didn't play hockey. He didn't play soccer. He was not the boy that my ex envisioned to have. Cognitively, I guess you could say he's on par with other kids. I just treat him like a regular kid. Uh, funny enough, with fine motor, I put him into piano. Little did I know, my son has an ear. He plays Beethoven on his piano, plays ACDC on his guitar, and recently he says, Mom, I want to play drums. He's very musically talented, but his father would say, but he's not, he can't skate. He can't play soccer. He takes too much after you. The arts. Look at mommy. Do you like the guitar? Yeah. 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 It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. I think my darkest day after the separation was the first morning that I woke up. That was really hard. It's really hard too. I can't believe it, it's still, <laughs> still so powerful, but I just remember looking at the bed next to me, thinking he's not there, you know, and then 
the days that followed, waking up every morning and seeing he's not there. I think that was, those were really dark days. You know, how do you, how do you get through that, right? It's pretty devastating when, you know, especially again, because he wasn't a jerk. He wasn't somebody that I wanted out of my life. I loved him dearly and he was gone. And I guess the physicality of that, you know, that he was gone was really devastating. When my ex decided he was gonna leave, I went and did research on the internet, how to tell your child you're going to separate. When I told my ex, we have to sit cold down, he said, he is not gonna understand. He is not gonna get it. So we went into the family room and my ex said, daddy needs to go away and find his own place. Why? Why do you need to do that? I thought, good for you, kid. Well, when are you gonna come back? When are you gonna be my dad and come back? The day that my ex left, that afternoon after he had gone, um, Cole had problems with his video game. He says, I need, I, need, I need daddy here. Something's gone wrong, I wanna play. And I said, Cole, daddy is gone. And he just broke down and cried. Like, oh, it breaks my heart and my sisters were there. And they had to leave the room because they were crying and Cole came up to me and he put his hands on my cheeks. And he said, I'm now the man of the house. I'll take care of you. So how we broke the news to our daughters about the separation is my one daughter was still living at home. And so we just told her in the living room what was going to happen. And then my other daughter had already left for university, so we actually Skyped her. And she thought, because we said, you know, we have bad news for you, she thought grandma had died or something, so she was crying. And then when she found out that it was our separation, she was like, oh, I'm okay. <laughs> so, and then the first thing that she said was, well, we know who the dog is gonna live with. <laughs> So that was the first thing that she said. Uh, and it's funny because my dog is very attached to me, so we knew that the dog would be staying with me. So in regards to telling the kids, we did not tell them either that we were gonna separate or that their dad was gay until about two months after his disclosure. Initially, my husband told our son alone that he was gonna be leaving and that he was gay. And that upset me because I really felt that we should have, you know, they should have been told together as with the four of us as a family unit. But then when they came back, my son and his dad from speaking, then my husband told me that he was now going to tell our daughter. So I followed him downstairs to where our daughter was watching TV and that's when he told her both that he would be leaving and he was gay. So we basically all ended up crying together, yeah. I have a total of three siblings, uh, two brothers and one sister. At the time, they would have been 11, nine, and two. Being the oldest, I felt like I had to be in a way a father figure, so I had a lot of feelings of protection, especially with my younger siblings, as well as a lot of anger and a lot of depression, I could say. I would say ups being upset, but it, it was more of a, a monkey on my back, so I would like to say depression. It was more of a depressing time for me. My mother had called me into her room and she then spoke very frankly and said that he, she and my father had separated. And 
she had packaged that information with other things, other other things that she had felt was a burden to know, that she needed to share. It didn't feel as though anything changed. He just wasn't around anymore, but his absence didn't leave a void. Colette didn't tell us about her separation at the time it occurred. We had just arrived from Florida and we got a phone call saying that her ex had left. Didn't quite know, no more information than that, but that they would be over in the next day or two. Both of them arrived in separate cars, which kind of made us wonder what was going on. They came in the house and we heard what to us was a horror story. I remember thinking to myself, good Lord, this is embarrassing. This is the second failed marriage in our family in less than a year. We had one daughter the, a year earlier who had separated, but there were no children involved. Colette's uh, situation was difficult in the sense that there was a child involved, especially with special needs. We really have to think about uh, where do we go from here? I lost friends, mostly his friends, really nice people, really nice people. I went to a group called Separation Anonymous, and the first thing they said was, you will lose approximately eight friends. Isn't it funny that I lost eight friends, his friends? But if I ran into them, they would hug me and say, how are you? We think about you. But, but then what I also realized is that my close friends, they weren't there for me. Friends who I knew kind of outside were the ones, family didn't call me, extended family didn't call me. How are you? Not that I'm pitying myself, but just a phone call to say, how are you? It would be nice. And when you don't get that, that's why I went to Separation Anonymous because I was in a group with people going through the same thing. And our homework was to call people in our group and vent and swear, and everybody had the same goal, separation, but all the stories and the walks of life and people of different faiths and, you know, a diverse group of people all had the same goal, but going through so much crap, men and women. Once we separated, I let the community know by sending out an email because I knew everyone would be talking and gossiping. I found out he was living with my friend um, from my daughter who came home one day and she was crying. And she said, you'll never guess who dad is dating. And right away I said my friend's name. The last thing we did as a family together was Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, we sat around that dining room table it was difficult to give thanks because everything that we had known as a family, all those happy times, was now very strained and stressful. So it was our very last family dinner together. And even now, all these years later, Thanksgiving Day is still a reminder of uh, what happened on that uh, difficult Thanksgiving day. I'm always going to bed afraid. I'm afraid for my son that he's not going to get the therapy that he should be getting and he's regressing already. I fear that I'm not going to get the support that I deserve and I lose sleep, um, gained weight. Um, it's, absolute, it's absolute hell. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And, and people at work don't get it. Half of them don't even have kids, so they wouldn't get it. I 
had the tunes on in the car and I was just starting to feel good about the direction we were going after my ex had left and I'm driving along not too far from home and all of a sudden my phone pings so I pull into my driveway read the text oh my god it was from the bank manager saying that um, I needed to come see her because I was basically on the hook for a line of credit that I had signed for. My ex had put some paperwork in front of me that stupidly I didn't read. And then on top of that, unbeknownst to me, the house was in the rears. So now I was on the hook for thousands of dollars because I trusted my ex. Shit. 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 Here I go again into that paralyzing state of fear, intense fear. So often through this ordeal, one of my greatest fears was that my daughter and I would end up homeless. <laughs> no. And I thought, how the hell am I gonna get us through this now? One of the things that really upset me with, in a conversation with Call It Sex was, oh, this is going to be a walk in the park. She'll do what I say. And that just infuriated me and the Papa Bear Claws came out. And I was committed to making sure that this was going to be a fair divorce if, it, if that's where it was going. Her responsibility was her son, my grandson. Her ex had indicated, I'll make the money, you take care of him. She had little or no knowledge of where the money came, where the money came from, other than the little part-time job she had, which was great to have her foot in, foot in something, but it wasn't going to be enough. And then uh, we went off to see a lawyer. So financially, when we first separated, it was status quo. He moved out um, and rented just around the corner from us, and I stayed. So I was still primary caregiver that none of my cards were cut off. There was nothing dramatic. When my husband left, he basically walked out on his family and didn't think he had to give us a cent. My daughter got up one morning and there was no hot water for her shower and she was going to school. And then we realized the oil tank was empty and when I called the oil company, they said that my husband had called and stopped the deliveries. I survived um, because of my family and um, wonderful friends who gave me money. They didn't lend me money because I didn't know how I could ever repay them. I wasn't able to pay the mortgage, but I was able to put um, oil in the tank and have heat in the house and pay the power bill um, and buy groceries. But I wasn't able to pay the mortgage, no. My mother was not in a good relationship with my father, so they had a very contentious relationship. And they're Sicilian, so they used to yell at each other all the time. And I just remember saying to my mom, like, why, why don't you guys split up? Because this is really not a good relationship. And she said, where am I gonna go? You know, I'm Sicilian with, you know, grade six education. I barely speak English. So I can't afford to feed four kids and, you know, take care of four kids. And so she really felt trapped in her marriage. And I remember thinking at that time, because I was a teenager at that time when she said that to me, and I thought, that's never gonna be me. That's never gonna be me. It was very hard integrating back into a full-time job after freelancing at home and being at home full-time with my kids. I didn't have a nanny or any other help with my children, and within about a six-month period, I had gone from being a seven-year stay-home freelancing mom to somebody who was out of the home in a full-time job schedule, also separated from my children 
two weeks a month and my youngest was five. I actually found it um, that I went through a bit of a depression on Sunday nights when I brought my children back to their dads for a full week. I think that tends to be a, a bit of a fearful point for a lot of women coming back to education. Um, in Ontario, as long as you're 19 or older, you're able to apply to come to college as a mature student. Did I go back to school? I actually went back to university. It was only three months after my husband left that I decided to return to university and do my master's in counseling psychology. I did that while holding down a full-time job. But I had so much fear around future relationships. You know, my belief system in even my capacity, my capabilities in a relationship, what I bring to the table, good, bad, and the ugly, and otherwise. So I was fearful of Get it, even though I ended it, I was fearful that maybe my heart will never end. Maybe his won't. Maybe I'll never, well, at the time I was like, I'd rather slam myself in a car door than the thought of like getting married again or, but, but those were my fears, like relationship-based fears. I had this very powerful belief that there was no way I was gonna find another soulmate like my ex again. That that was it. That was my one shot. <laughs> that was it. He was gone. So I went to Burning Man. And I went to Burning Man because I really wanted to let it go. That's the premise of Burning Man. You go and you let it go. And there's a temple at Burning Man where you go in silent contemplation and you bring, I brought a picture of you know, my ex and I and I wrote a note on it and I put it in the temple and there's pictures everywhere around the temple as people are letting things go. And I sat in the temple and cried and said goodbye and said it's time to let this go. And that's when I had the revelation, oh my gosh. You're not here to let go of this marriage. You are here to let go of the belief that you will never find another soulmate again. You have to let that go. After my separation, it was about a year and a half. I was at a social event, certainly no interest in dating because I really felt I had not healed sufficiently and I just had no time for dating with working full time and attending university, so that was so far off my radar. But a chance meeting with a man, um, he, he pursued me. So um, I guess even though we dated, we went out for dinners together, I, was, I resisted for a long time, yes. Is that man still in your life? That man was a very smart man. He waited for me. He is still in my life. And we've been very happy now for, well, we've lived in this home now for 15 years. Yeah. I would definitely agree that going to family court is a soul-crushing event. Um, walking into the family court building, um, immediately my heart sank and I just thought, you know what, my ex-husband and I are two intelligent people. We should have been able to resolve this without the intervention of the court system. And you're sitting there sort of saying, but this is gonna impact you know, my five-year-old and where he lives. I always had this idea that, oh yeah, divorce is hard, but you know, it's not that hard. Like it's, you know, it's not the end of the world until I went through it <laughs> and I realized, oh my gosh, this is devastating. And I have an amicable divorce and 10 years of resilience training. So how do women do this? How do men do this? This is a devastating thing. In looking for alternatives that could help families through the separation and divorce process, I heard about a method that was developed by Bill Eddy. 
I thought it was worth knowing more about. So after research, I found Bill in San Diego, California. Through Bill's work in family law, counseling, and mediation, he came to recognize that the same issues kept coming up with the families he was working with, and he wanted to help them and others. So he developed the method, New Ways for Families. High conflict situations, maybe 20% of, of separations. What can we do to change the way these cases go so they don't get stuck in the, the, the litigation system, the adversarial process? I took all my experience as a therapist and as a lawyer and as a mediator. I could see what needed to be done and how to do it. So I, I developed this really as a way to take out the adversarial process and to make it a cooperative process of learning skills. I took my husband to court for contempt because he wasn't paying me. And they found him not guilty, but he wasn't paying me. And he wasn't, wasn't abiding by the court order, but they didn't find him in contempt. So in my first uh, court order, we had stipulated that my ex-partner would put a certain uh, number of dollars into the children's educational fund in lieu of child support. Um, I found out uh, about two years ago, so uh, maybe 10 years after we had signed that agreement, that um, he had emptied that fund. We had the court order saying that he had to apply X hundreds of dollars per month in lieu of child support into uh, the account uh, that was under his name. So I didn't actually have access to those, the bank records. And it happened to come to light in the financial disclosure that he had emptied and closed the children's RESP account. I've heard so many stories of separation that it made me want to understand the legal process for myself. I wondered if there were better ways to ease the separation and divorce process, whether embroiled in lengthy litigation or in collaborative mediation. If the support, child support paying parent opens up a registered education savings plan, that parent can walk into the financial institution at any time, six months later, a year later, five years later, collapse the plan and take out the money. I would call it sort of a friendly outside of the system negotiation. The ex-partner often finds it more tolerable, the idea that the money isn't going in the ex-partner's hand, it's going directly into a fund for the kids, which is why uh, I believe that it was recommended to me by various um, lawyers and mediators. What they didn't tell me when they recommended this type of settlement was that, um, that those monies were outside the collectible purview of the Family Responsibility Office. So once I agreed to that, um, there was absolutely no legal mechanism or follow-up to make sure that that money was collected, put in the right kind of account, and used for what it was uh, earmarked for. I had an ex-partner who I felt had a lot of problems with financial responsibility. I was very concerned about him saving for the kids' university. I didn't feel he was the type of individual that was going to volunteer to pay to support his children when they weren't under his roof. He'd said things of this nature, so I felt that I needed a proper separation agreement, a proper custody agreement, a proper child support agreement. We had a 70-page separation agreement, gave it to him. He refused to read it. He's refused to read it. And you know how much money that is when you have to pay? He's the one who left. I'm paying the goddamn fee for the separation agreement. I'm trying to get it done. Nobody wants to have a high conflict separation, but about 20% of people do. What you can do is with the children is be careful not to badmouth the other parent in front of them, to really focus on what their needs are and to speak in neutral terms about the other parent or speak in positive terms so they don't get brought into the conflict because that's where a lot of high conflict divorces and separations get started. One afternoon, I was picking up my 10-year-old daughter at my ex's house. I was taken aside by a reliable adult and shown something really upsetting. My daughter had written a petition to the court. She was begging the court to order her dad not to pay child support. 
It was obvious she hadn't come up with these concepts on her own. I was devastated to see in my daughter's own handwriting that she'd been made aware of the concept of support and come up with skewed ideas that vilified me and then took it all around to her classmates to sign. Trying to deal with the legalities from the kids being five years old to them potentially being 23, you have what's called material change in circumstance. So when my daughter decided she wanted to just live with me, that required an accounting adjustment and literally every adjustment that we embarked on was not a matter of weeks or months, but literally a matter of years. Well, it's simply, the, it, it is the design of the system. There could be many disclosure issues. Some could fail to disclose assets. For instance, if this matter is moving to a trial stage, you know, it could be a year, two years, longer than that. I think any therapist or psychologist would tell you, you know, don't make major life decisions when you're in a state of distress. That just seems like common sense. Um, and yet, it just doesn't seem possible. Um, I've never met anyone whose separation is so uh, amicable that they don't have a distress factor. We've never been to court, no. In fact, we went through a collaborative law process, which was very amicable again. It's sometimes too amicable, because it's like, are we getting this done? Or we're kind of like, well, whatever. So, but that was a very good process to go through. We decided right at the beginning, we were, you know, actually as part of the collaborative law process, you have to agree that you are not going to go to court. So it was, and it was lovely. It was a great process to go through. Most people who separate never see the inside of a courthouse. What do they do? Give me a guesstimate, percentage -wise. I have heard numbers like, uh, and I, so I have no idea about the accuracy of these numbers, but I have heard numbers like 90% of people never see the inside of a courthouse. They, yet the courts are busy. The courts are busy. That's because we have a lot of people separating. I was there the day Susan was interviewed, and being her best friend, I knew a lot of things, but I learned things that day that I had no idea about. When I had to leave my home, I tried to stay, and I represented myself in court because I couldn't afford a lawyer. And that day, um, it was ordered that I be out of the house in two days. And this was a 5,000 square foot home with everything we had, you know, gathered in the last 26 years. So I ordered two big U-Haul trucks. I called all the friends I still had and some family. And in two days, we emptied that house. The sheriff um, was there when we were putting the stuff on the lawn and came in and told us that time was up and we had to, we had to go. And the sad thing is we left um, my ex-husband's grandmother's piano that was very, very dear to my daughter. And uh, it was sold with the house and she'll never get it back. I didn't have any place to put the stuff in the TU hall, so for two weeks, it sat in my friend's, um, he had a big commercial garage, and he let me park the U-Hauls in the garage parking lot for two weeks. And I had to rent, um, rent a place for two weeks until I found another place to go. I live in an apartment that I can't afford to rent here in Halifax. The only way I was able to get that apartment is because I knew um, the daughter of the person who was renting it. And she didn't do a credit check, or I would never have been able to get the apartment. So we have a lot of unrepresented people. A colleague of mine and I, we actually had a little chart that we kept going for about six months to see what percentage of people were unrepresented in domestic matters, and it came to about 60%. There are a number of reasons why people are uh, coming into court without lawyers. One reason is because some people feel they can do it better than lawyers. Another reason is because uh, lawyers are very expensive and they simply don't want to spend their money on lawyers. The third reason, and I think the most uh, prevalent reason that people come in 
unrepresented is because they can't get legal aid and yet they don't earn nearly enough money to go out and hire a lawyer privately. So they just don't have any choice but to come in and represent themselves. We had a very long, painful um, legal process. We had signed off on a partial custody agreement um, when I first left, specifying how many days the kids would be um, at each other's homes. But we actually didn't fully sign off on our very first court order until we'd been separated for four years. So I was functioning with no child support, no spousal support until the first court order was signed. Four years later. Four years. If people are delinquent in their support payments, they can lose their driver's license, they can lose their passport, and in the most serious cases, they can go to jail. I actually have never added up how much I've spent in lawyers, and um, I'm a pretty meticulous uh, bookkeeper and record keeper. And I have intentionally never added up um, what uh, my legal costs have been because I felt that if I discovered that I was in a net loss against what I eventually got um, in less than federal table minimum child support, that that would be too depressing for me to be able to handle the knowledge of. So I actually have never run the numbers. I've paid thousands in lawyer fees. I got a line of credit. Um, I don't want to know. I don't want to know, so I don't know. The hardest thing, the thing that sprang right to my mind as soon as you said what was the hardest thing in this process was my physical separation from my small children when I initially moved out. I mean, the legal stuff, it's been exhausting, it's been financially exhausting, but it's something that I've been able to handle as an adult. I don't feel like I can ever give my son his mother back at the age of five. The stress and distress of what was looking like a custody battle, um, the feelings that I had after being a stay-at-home mom for seven years of being separated from my two children who I had never been more than arm's length from. It's hard to describe how devastating it was um, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I had an aunt who became ill with cancer and passed away in that six months from the time I asked for divorce and I stepped out of the house. And many years later, my sister was asking me or having a conversation with me about how our aunt passed away. And I realized that I had no memory of her illness, where she was in hospital, what surgery she had, when she died, where she was buried. All of that situation with my aunt happened in that six months. And I think when I hear medical descriptions of shock, um, you know, your memory doesn't work the same way. So things that didn't have to do with my kids, I don't even remember. Uh, my oldest daughter, because she had gone to university, as I mentioned, she didn't really see much of a difference, right? So, and she has such a good relationship with her father and she has a great relationship with me too that we see each other, we see her separately or we might come together and have dinners together. My youngest, I think, has really been hit hard with, with all of it. I think she had a really hard time with the separation. She was not happy about it. She did not want to be a child of divorce. She had emotional struggles and some anxiety around it as well. But she has been incredibly resilient and has been really resourceful even for her other girlfriends. And I'm really, really proud of how she got through everything that she got through and got through high school. And, um, it, it, you know, my daughters are both amazing girls. So they got through. You know, we got through it together. Leaving elementary school, I was introduced to substances, you know, things that would have helped me dull the pain at the time, but later would have came to bite me in the butt in a way. Um, they've caught up with me right now, you know what I mean? So I'm at this, at this place in my life where I had to eliminate all those things. I was doing for many years and trying to shift, trying to get away from that, uh, trying to live a good life and not use what my life, my past has as an excuse 
to do these things. Um, that was the biggest. That was the biggest fight I had. That was the biggest mental fight I had that I've I recently overcame. And I've been, you know, I've been on a good road so far, and I'm I'm really happy about that. A lot of people are under the delusion that their children don't know, or they're not being impacted because they try to keep it separate. Kids do know. And, and the way I help people understand that is because I remind them that when they were a child, they knew. And that's, that's compelling for them. I think it's when dad started sleeping downstairs and I asked why. And I guess I took the answer, but it didn't make sense. And I feel like it was something to do with snoring. It was something to do with snoring. But that didn't fully make sense to me because mom would also snort. <laughs> um, but I guess I, I took the answer, but something felt wrong. I do remember them arguing, and I don't remember amicable arguments. I hear screams and shrieks and profanity. It was as though the only passion I can really recall when their marriage was winding down was when they came to argue. When I was younger, I would immerse myself in any sort of distraction I could. And typically that manifested as playing video games. Look what Brennan's doing. Surprise, surprise. Playing a video game on the computer. Until recently, I didn't know what it did to me. And the way I've remembered it over the years is me being in my room or being wherever it is in the house and hearing that and then freezing and going in, I guess my entire body going into shock. I had TV in my room, so whenever they would fight, I would turn the TV on really loud, and I would put my hands on my ears, and I would just pretend like it wasn't happening. I would be very hard on myself during the fighting because I wasn't doing anything to stop it. And each time, if I would end, I would say, next time, I'm going to do something, I'm going to say something, and I guess that happened every time, so... Every time I would get hard, I'd be hard on myself and I'd be frustrated. What would your 20-something self say to that innocent little girl back when? It's not your fault. And there's nothing you could have done. Or you did the best you knew how to do then. My sister had a lot of self-blame. She had questions, you know, as to why he left. And I remember a text message that I saw from my sister um, to my younger brother. You know, when after he left, was this was this because of me? Like, was this my was it was it my fault that you left? Hiding the fact that you're going through separation and trying to dress it as taking a break or trying to avoid that difficult conversation is is so unimaginable, unimaginably damaging to the perception of you in your children's eyes. You might think you're protecting them by having an argument and keeping it relegated to the basement, but they can hear you. The most vivid memory I have of that time um, was actually the last day that my mom and dad were living under the same roof. And I remember that day, more so than any other day. It started off as a normal day. You know, my dad works long hours um, and 
he was on his way to work and things just went south right from there, right from the morning. You know, I, you could hear them arguing, which wasn't an uncommon thing. They did argue often in the morning and at night because my dad does work long hours. And so I, that's, you start, you know, get used to it. You start getting used to the arguments. And this one just was a lot more, not, was a lot more vicious and it, it spiraled very fast and escalated far, far greater than any other argument I've ever listened or, you know, witnessed. witnessed. When he left that day, did he come back? <laughs> no, my dad did not come back that day. He, uh, like I said, the police got involved and he did end up in custody. We'd had three floods. The worst was the first one. Anything that we salvaged was dispersed all through the upstairs. So my daughter and I were banished to our bedrooms and the island had my editing equipment. My daughter and I couldn't have friends over. We had to eat in our rooms, watch TV in our rooms. She had to do her homework in her room. Throughout that time, I begged and asked repeatedly for my ex to help me deal with the claim because I had no idea on how much certain things cost. So on this particular day, I walked into the office and I was not leaving until he sat down with me or gave me a clear cut answer that was acceptable. Ron, we have to talk. Sonny, I don't have time right now. Ron, we have to talk. Sonny, I told you I don't have time. Listen, I'm not leaving until we have this conversation about insurance. I can't live like this anymore. It's been 16 freaking months. I don't give a fuck. I need to get this done right now. He cursed at me, told me to shut up, get out. I held my ground and I wasn't gonna leave. So he got up from his desk and rushed towards me. Run! He told me to go ahead and call the police. After all that I was going through, all I needed now was him to make up a story and the police believe him over me. So I never did call the police. You know, abuse is a big word. And I even had so much pride to feel like I'm not a victim. You know, I'm not a victim. I am strong and I wouldn't put up with that. Um, but there is, there is definitely abusive tendencies. And just no physical bruises to go along with them. Um, which sometimes would make it more real, you know, like the the psychological pain or the effects from, you know, those types of altercations. But yeah, there was there was there was a space that abuse lived in our in our marriage. He didn't allow me to have a connection to the outside world, the online world. Um, the day that he left, my sister came and picked me up, and she drove me to um, to get a, a cell phone. Uh, with email and now because if I got a shift at work I didn't know I had to get a phone call so this way if their shifts were available I could get a shift he didn't want me to have that link to the outside world it felt very isolating so when I got this phone even the person um, at the center where I got the phone was shocked that I was not allowed to have a phone with emails and, and he was very angry when I did get a phone and I had emails. He was extremely angry that I did that. One of the problems that's raised maybe in 50% of family court cases about parenting is domestic violence. The red flags would be if she's being stalked or harassed, not respected. And of course, there's a variety of ways to do that these days through emails and texts, not just directly, but also indirectly. Those would be the times. So sometimes a child resists going to see the other parent and they fear the other parent and they feel maybe the other parent's been abusive or something. There's a big question mark. And so family courts often order a child custody evaluation. 
We actually have a duty to report if there are issues where someone is a risk to themselves, someone is a risk to a child, uh, it's duty of professional to report that. We want to look uh, for opportunities also to rehabilitate the other spouse. I provide a lot of therapeutic support to abused women. There's, there's a few of us in the field that have been working in it extensively for a, a good deal of our career. And we certainly, we do what we describe as getting it. We understand the dynamics that abused women um, experience in their homes. We know that women are abused over 30 times before they ever reach out and call the police. And people don't. So I never did call the police. People don't because their friends tell them not to. It's very hard, you know, and even a lot of perpetrators believe that it was such an easy thing to call the police. It's the hardest thing that a woman will ever have to do is call the police on her partner, the man that she loves, the father of her children, and turn him in. One case in particular stands out for me of a woman who was going home to, to tell her husband finally that, her, that the marriage was over and she thought she'd be fine, that one more time she could endure a beating. And she understood in her mind that that's what would happen. Little did she know he had purchased a gun. And when she got home and announced that, he began shooting her. And she ran around her home trying to escape from him. She had five children who were all, you can imagine, freaking out beside themselves. Um, she, one of her sons called 911, and it's, it's gut-wrenching to hear that 911 call. And I remember her saying to me very clearly that she'd been shot in the jaw and she couldn't speak, but she said to me, Bev, I could think. And when he stopped shooting, I managed to get into the kitchen and sit at the kitchen table. And she said it was so important to me to sit at the kitchen table because I didn't want to fall and I didn't want to die in front of my children. And those are the cases that people need to hear about and see. But the downside of that is that those are extreme cases that people understand and that are obvious to people when they occur. The subtle misuse of power and control that women endure in their homes on a daily basis um, is, is what people don't understand, that dynamic, that misuse of power. After I had rented a home that I could afford if my ex was paying me on time, he wasn't paying me on time, um, and so I wasn't paying the electric bill, and I woke up one morning and the power was off and I had no money to pay the power bill. Um, I went back to bed and I stayed in bed for two days. She did not want to get out of bed. She didn't want to function. And I was scared that she would hit a point where she would end it. Something during my separation I didn't share with a lot of people or really many people, was how sad I was. Um, that sometimes I would drop the kids off from school and just get back into bed until it was time to pick them up. I guess I held, I held that in and hid it from people. Susan would contact me when she was at a very low point, when she would have a day that she was really down and out and feeling like she didn't want it to go on, I would get a text. And I would talk to her. I would come if she wanted me to. I just had to get her through it. Do I want to be working at my age? Absolutely not. There are days where I basically rather kill myself than go to work. But I do, because I need to. Do you mean that, Susan? I do mean that. And what stops you? I want to see my children grow. 
I want to see them have babies, and I want to see them get married. It's the only thing that stops me. As I was maturing, this was happening. Saying if it changed Skylar, like Skylar being a four-year-old or five-year-old, I think I, I never lost my spark or my happiness, even when I was very, very sad. So I don't see it as changing me, but affecting me. The depression did take its toll throughout my youth. I mean, going to bed was a task at times, you know, going, going, falling asleep with a million and one thoughts in your head. You know, how can I be the best I can be as well as why is this happening to me? And just a whole, a whole lot of emotions that I've never felt before and that they just all hit me at once. My kids didn't go to a therapist. Uh, it was always on offer. It was always um, made available to them. Um, the advice that I received ongoing from many different sources uh, was not to push therapy if it was something that they didn't want. We discussed it at many different times, at many different ages, and we still, we're still discussing it today. I didn't go to therapy, no. I, I did see my counselors at school. Um, both in elementary school and high school, and they did have a key role in my success in both elementary and my high school uh, life. I'm sure they accepted it, but again, it takes time, I think, to absorb that. So, and they were, neither one of them would go for counseling. So I think, um, I think in their own way, they struggled, absolutely. Cole went to therapy as social worker. I found a child social worker. And because Cole has a difficult time like enunciating or pronouncing, he saw we were walking in, and I don't go into the session. I just sit outside. He walked into the reception, and he said to the therapist, perfect language, we need to talk because I'm so angry. And anyways, I went into the therapy room. And on the board, she wrote down all the things. And she said, I need to call your ex. I need to talk to him. Guess what? My ex never returned her phone call. He didn't want to hear it. What I experienced that nobody knows that's related to Colette's own separation was the hurt. My own father did to my mother when he walked out at his sister's wedding, never to be seen against. I fought like cats and dogs with my dad. The day he left my mother. And God, I regret that. I regret that now. <laughs> your father is your father. Good or bad. I guess you gotta make peace somewhere along the line. You can't carry that hate forever. And that's something I really regret. Never told that to my mother. She's now dead. So I've carried that, carried that with me. So I guess what I try to do with my girls is keep the communication open, help them where I can, 
I don't know. I love it. Thanks for helping me get that out. After how many years? He died in 1983. It's amazing how you suppress memories, suppress feelings. Going through this experience, everything comes right back up. I had two sort of rocks uh, in this whole process, and one was my mom or my parents, which who were just, I remember driving up to my parents' house and the kids were still closed in the car and uh, I just stepped out in front of the car to talk to my mother and I just sort of looked her in the face and I said, um, you know, the marriage is over, we're getting a divorce. And she didn't, I don't think she really expected uh, to hear that. I could see her well up a little bit, she had a little tear coming and she shut that down uh, pretty quickly and just basically flipped it into what can we do for you and I think sort of dealt with any of her emotional reaction or sadness or distress or disappointment privately. So I think she didn't want me to worry about her feelings or comforting her. Um, so she, uh, I think she suppressed her, her own reaction and own, her own needs so that she could support me. Um, and the other huge support was um, a wonderful therapist that I had on and off for, for 20 years who's now retired. And without those two ladies, uh, I'm not sure how well I would have fared. My biggest supporters during my separation, definitely my parents. They've bent over backwards, especially when I work and that they need to take care of Cole. But if I had to say one person, it would be my dad. <sighs> I call him the basement lawyer because we meet, oh, I meet probably once a week, going over the agreement, going over everything. He's there doing my budget, giving me pep talks, saying, be a good mom, I'll take care of the rest. He's really been there and I don't know, I don't know where I would be him. But another person who really gets me, gives me strength, is a man I've been dating. Um, his name is Phil, and he's also separated, actually now divorced. And we met each other at Separation Anonymous. We became good friends, and over a period of time, there was definitely an attraction. We're both going through it together. Um, I'm a lot more in pain than he is with his ex. Um, but I would say, for the most part, um, Phil has been a godsend. He's a wonderful man. I think my driving force and my reason were my kids. So they were the forefront of supporting me in ways that they didn't even know or wasn't even intentional. I'd like to say I have a good relationship with my mom, although I know I'm lying when I say that. Uh, I really don't have a good relationship with her. You know, I don't, we don't talk on a daily basis right now. And it's heartbreaking, but this is the current situation. And it's something that I would like to work on. And I know my mom definitely would too. Um, but I think we still have a lot of self-healing to do. On both aspect, on both on both ends. Um, so, I, I, the truth, I don't think we have a sufficient relationship at the moment. My father wasn't involved with any of the difficulties I experienced. I don't recall a time when I sat down with him or I spoke openly about what I had experienced. But my mother was always there for me. My mother was always my advocate. My mother was always my sister's advocate when she had troubles. And she always championed her children. And in conversations that I've had with her, 
that is perhaps where their marriage first came to deteriorate. My father's lack of action, lack of involvement, lack of concern for this isolation I experienced, for the difficulties I had with the faculty. I've never had a conversation with him about what I experienced the bullying I experienced, the... the helplessness I felt. And my mother is a incredibly strong woman. And I don't know what that said to her about a man that she loved failing to rise to the occasion. Brother made that for me. It says, love lasts forever. That's nice. That's nice to meet you, And I can remember when everything was over with regards to Colette and the success we had at the mediation and I knew everything was going to be all right. Mind you, her ex dragged it out another year before he finally signed it. But uh, Cole was protected. That was the number one. The money is there for his education and, uh, and it gives her an opportunity now to develop a career that it won't be money for the rest of her life, but uh, it'll go a long way. And for her to find happiness. So do you plan to get married? Yes, I, I would like to get married, but... There's... There's a hesitancy or a reluctance because... I, I'm afraid of making the same mistakes my parents did. It's an eye opener for both of them and you can see it on a daily basis that they still live with that kind of, that, that kind of emotion, that kind of fear, pain, anxiety to a degree, um, and even the depression, but they both of them still face that on a daily basis and it, it, it's an unfortunate aspect, but it's the reality of it. There's still going to always be an element of disappointment, you know? There's still a cloud hanging over me that I got married and it didn't work out. And that's not what, that's not what I ever wanted my legacy to be, that I got separated or that I failed. My ex is still controlling my next steps. I can't control my life until this is over. And he is still controlling me. I wish I could say that it's over and I'm moving on, but in April, my husband took me back to court. I'm happy to say I got a new job, which pays me a lot more money. Um, so my career is moving forward nicely. As far as relationships, um, I haven't had any in four and a half years and still none on the horizon. I'm healing for sure, but I'm not totally there. I just want to stop fighting and get on with my life. Well, I've been divorced for two years. Cole is now going into grade 11. He's thriving, he's got lots of friends. So if you come by my place, you'll hear Beethoven on the piano and a little bit of ACDC on the guitar. So he loves that, he's volunteering to get his hours to graduate.
For me, work-wise, well, I'm a voice actor. I wanted to be one in 1995. When I first got married, I was told, you can't do that. Well, not only do I have an agent going on auditions, getting some great gigs, so that brings in some extra money. As far as my personal life is concerned, well, I went last month with Phil to Paris. We went to the top of the Eiffel Tower and he proposed, I'm engaged. From a legal point of view, my ex-husband and I have been in on-again, off-again litigation for the entire 13 years, mostly over child support adjustments. After that relationship ended, I took a little time for some self-care and wellness. My kids were a little older. I had a little more time to myself and to think about what I really wanted. And I got back onto the dating scene a little while ago and have been seeing someone new for about the last six months. Um, and quite happy to see where things are going and feeling like there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And even though things change and there's ups and downs, uh, I've always felt that there's something to look forward to around the next corner. It's just over five years since I've been separated. Thankfully, things have, have settled quite a bit. We are co-parenting quite well. Friendship is kind of starting to grow, which is really beneficial for the kids because we're able to really keep them at our, at our focus and our priority. I still process the separation, and I think that I will probably for the rest of my life. I was supposed to be married for the rest of my life. There's also just a good surrendering that we're both in, in a good place right now. The kids are happy. After my separation, I went back to school. I stayed at home with the kids for over 10 years. So I was kind of driven towards more of my passion. And through my dad's death, I saw a lot of gaps and, and holes in palliative care. So I went back to school for PSW and end of life practitioner. On a casual basis, I take clients at the end of their life and kind of help them navigate through their final stages. Dating-wise, I am dating. Um, I'm currently in a long-distance romance relationship, um, which, you know, comes with its challenges and its benefits, but it works for us right now. And uh, who knows what the future holds. When I had totally healed, a colleague and I, we formed a support group for the straight spouses of lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgendered individuals. When I, the majority of my clients are dealing with relationship issues, as well as couples, individuals or couples, uh, dealing with sexual orientation issues. I wrote a book. Annie's story, How to Move Beyond the Pain of a Spouse's Homosexuality. I entered the Global Changemaker Series competition. I was one of 10 who was then selected to go on stage at Glenn Gould Studio in Toronto and presented my story as well. It's been four years since my separation, and I'm now fully divorced. We actually had a very amicable divorce, and my ex and I have been on really good terms. We're still really good friends. We still get together with family regularly, which is really nice. As far as work goes, well, I finished my book. I started writing my book, and then when the separation started, I found it very, very difficult to continue to write, and I had so many friends tell me, you know, this is the time to write. This is the time to get back on track, and they really encouraged me, and so I did get back on track, and I did launch my book, and since then as well, I've had um, lots of speaking engagements, and uh, my business has just been growing ever since so business wise has actually been booming I have been dating for the past four years but you know it's uh, and that's been up and down as well I've met some really nice men and not so nice men <laughs> and I just figure if I'm happy with my life and everything that's going on with my life that that's what is most important and if somebody special comes along you know that that the one hasn't come along yet but if that person comes along great and if they don't life is great too and I'm just going to continue to focus on being happy and taking care of my family 
and loving what I do. Even though I went through hell, we went through hell. My daughter graduated high school with honors. In fact, both her and my younger son graduated with honors. At the end of high school, she traveled the world for a year and um, is now studying what she's passionate about, which is marine biology. And my son studied psychology and is working for his father and producing. And stay tuned for his work. <sighs> I was able to save our home thanks to a couple of angels. Um, one in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after I managed to turn things around, my children and I did some traveling and um, we started our healing process during that time of travel. And I went back to acting and produced this documentary. This one's for you, Shane, Skyler, and Brennan. I love you with all my heart. Is that Brennan? Hey, look. Look who it is. This is the Bon Voyage. Did you have fun today? Yeah. How much? A lot. Packing up my life in boxes, hoping to forget my losses. I'm moving on to bigger and better things and bigger dreams. And maybe I can make a new start, open new doors in my heart, and let the new light shine on me. Cause it's a big, beautiful. once more but I'd be lying if I told you I didn't dream of a house on the ocean where I could write music with all of my friends and it's amazing how much less we see when our heads are down and we don't believe in what we were made to be
Is there 